Introduction to the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800. By François René de Chateaubriand. Introduction by the French editor. We have undertaken to say a few words by way of introduction to this work, having long been desirous to express our sentiments respecting Monsieur de Chateaubriand, one of those great hearts which elevate literature, and cause the humblest of writers to step forward more firmly in the pride of his profession. For these eighteen years, literature has been so compromised by a host of giddy aspirants, to such a degree has it been made a matter of boasting and of trade, and so impudently has the reader of the nineteenth century been jeered while being robbed, that we have need to be thankful to that writer who has invariably proved himself the most worthy without ceasing to be the most renowned he stood alone in the age he was the honest man he was the great man his name filled literature and flooded it with a golden light the republic came and he withdrew mild and melancholy hand in hand with those who have loved him his remains were conveyed to bretagne agreeably to his last wish and there is no more to say now go to that silent house in the rue du bac numbered a hundred and twelve they will show you Chateaubriand's room, Chateaubriand's table, the bed on which he expired. If we now endeavour to recall some traits of that mighty and melancholy genius, if we descend step by step through his works, it is not so much to perform the duty of critic as to pay a last homage to him who was for so long a period the most brilliant expression of literary France, the last gentleman, perhaps, the greatest Christian to a certainty. Chateaubriand belongs to that family of colossal thinkers before whom one pauses twice before one undertakes to go round them their collective works excite a respect which their character and the warm esteem that we have vowed to them would scarcely command it is ever since the consulate that the glory of the author of the genie du christianisme has endured and in france if the success of an hour is rarely right the success of half a century is never wrong he who has been the great man for fifty years is sure of being so for ever what strikes us most in chateaubriand's work is chateaubriand the history of a thought is sometimes as full of instruction as the thought itself the author is the first of his books or at least that which furnishes the key to all the others now tell us where is a finer history than that of this poet of this soldier of this traveller of this minister of this ambassador of this peer of france not a shore but he has visited not a glory but he has tasted not a misery but he has suffered i am aware that in this history he will relate himself that he has made of it a book in which with scaffold or flourish of trumpets at their head the prodigious events wherein he was mixed up will pass before us i am aware that this book profound as the confessions epic and forceful as the bulletin of the grand army full of kindly feeling as the sentimental journey will tell all and conceal nothing but frankly as chateaubriand relates his own history there is one thing from which he recoils that is self-praise one cannot pass along the street and look at one's self from the window we disguise not from ourselves the temerity and the importance of the lines which we are about to offer from the brilliant place which chateaubriand occupies in the age he would deserve perhaps that a more eminent pen than ours should record his glory and his genius we belong not to the generation which saw him live we belong to that which saw him die but we shall belong more especially to that which shall see him survive himself where then would be the harm of occasionally asking youth its opinion of the men and things of the time it is worth while to consider what is thought of the present generation by those who are to form the future one one morning last july two black vehicles mournfully reached the shore of brittany in one of them was the body of a great thinker in the other were a clergyman a testamentary executor and francois the valet de chambre in this manner these two carriages arrived at a small town near avranches while they were standing in the road waiting for horses a lady of a certain age holding a modest bouquet wrapped in paper timidly approached she laid her present on the seat within saying in a low voice that is for monsieur de chateaubriand tis all i have been able to procure we will do like the old lady here is our bouquet one chateaubriand entered life by the great door of the forests a native of that gloomy bretagne which produces only human oaks or homesick conscripts he ever retained the twofold character of force and melancholy the fairies with golden harps who keep watch beneath those antique canopies dropped upon his cradle the sacred vervain to bind upon his brow he was brought up in a black castle where he heard the singing of the sea the sea his first and his latest passion but his youth was sad as a poem of oshin's fling not your children into woods nature and nature alone is a dangerous mistress who will make savages of them unless she makes them poets monsters unless she makes them geniuses 
it is better to be jostled at first by society than to get hurt by running against the trunks of trees the evil which comes from man is more easily cured than that which proceeds from god then like henry heine's drummer le grand chateaubriand had tears which he could not shed in the castle of combourg family endearments and the fireside laugh were unknown never did he feel two arms encircling his neck his mother pushed him out to the church his father pushed him to nothing hesitating and forlorn he contented himself with making bad verses when from the recesses of his youth wild as that of rousseau arose that mysterious love which at a later period produced us a masterpiece of touching sorrow oh yes it is in the first love of poets that we must seek the secret of their lives energy or weakness their tenderness or their cruelty their humiliation or their glory only think that all this lurks in embryo in the heart of the first female that they meet with it is manon telling us of the extravagances and the silly tears of the abbe prevost it is pimpette whose kisses drew bursts of laughter from voltaire forsaken frederica relating her story to goethe's faust and the pale smile of lucile chateaubriand adding a page to rene that history to which there is nothing similar full of gloomy daring that grand tragedy in five or six leaves where drops of blood mingled no doubt with the ink wherewith they were written that little fatalist romance contains chateaubriand quite entire to others are left the love composed of smiles and adventures the sonnet sighed forth at the feet of a woman with pearls at her wrist in a perfumed boudoir in Britannia, on the margin of the sea beneath trees uttering everlasting wailings things follow a different course love the vice et tau, of the heart is composed of a more fatal essence it is rarely that one is cured of it chateaubriand never was poor breton gentleman child of unpropitious solitudes one day in calling to mind thy desolate youth thou wast destined to make this involuntary avowal we are persuaded that great writers have introduced their own history into their works to paint the heart well we must draw from our own and attribute the picture to another and the better part of genius is composed of recollections her name was lucile that name he never pronounced he never wrote she was a young girl or rather the shadow of a young girl scarcely gliding over the ground and ready to dissolve into waving vapour like those figures which painters vaguely show in the distance of enchanted forests from i know not what motive explained by medical science the undulations of her neck long and flexible as that of a swan were compressed by a steel necklace this strange girl was consumed by a nervous sensibility developed to excess and to see her frail graceful and pale you would take her for one of those virgins born of a tear who are to be met with in certain mystic poems both of them the brother and the sister frequently walked out on the heath or seated on the steps of the pond suffered starry night to descend upon them with its confused noises and its strong perfumes which imperceptibly win the heart and finally overwhelm it why would he have put an end to his life one day having the gun upon his arm he descended the steps of the castle more slowly than usual and directed his course towards the woods on reaching the end of the great avenue he turned about to look over the trees at a turret and disappeared so rene too had meditated suicide but between the grave and him there arose a voice ungrateful creature wouldst thou make away with thyself and thy sister lives thou suspectest her heart no explanation no excuse i know all i have comprehended all as if i had been with thee is it possible to deceive me me who have witnessed the origin of thy first sentiments behold thy unhappy disposition thy disgusts thy injustices promise while i press thee to my heart promise that it is the last time thou wilt give way to thy follies swear never to make any attempt upon thy life chateaubriand kept the oath of rene some hours afterwards apparently calm he returned to the castle of combourg what had passed in his soul god alone knows all strong-minded men reckon such a day at their entrance into life a day on which they ask themselves if it is necessary to go any further and if it would not be better to destroy thought than to suffer it to destroy them whether an innocent death is not preferable to a guilty life and which is the least distressing of the two the young suicide of chatterton or the old suicide of jean jacques those who get over this trial are the ambitious man and the christian on the point of drowning himself the one gazed on the water with a smile and turned back this was napoleon the other averted his fowling piece with a tear that is chateaubriand i have said that there was an intention of making him a priest at the college to which he was sent with this view a chamber was allotted to him with the bed of parny that little gentleman whose guerre de dieu is to this day the delight of felons in that chamber and on that pillow redolent of libertine rhymes chateaubriand strove in vain to become a priest he could not find a frock to fit him in spite of himself he was obliged to compress his life in order to bring it to the level of society and as at that time it was absolutely necessary to be something till one could become somebody he donned the first uniform that fell into his hands 
and much better do I like to see Chateaubriand enter the world with a sword than in a frock. Proceeding from a soldier and a gentleman, the religious restoration which he is destined to found some day will be on that account the more important and the more solid. There is crusader's blood in his veins. It is Tancred returning to plant the cross for the second time on the sepulchre of the Son of God. Figure to yourself a tall young man, very slender, rather high-shouldered, as are all the great military races, according to one of his expressions. His manner is uneasy, almost timid. He has an habitual stoop of the head, but it is a head chiselled with breadth like most Breton heads, thick hair, thick eyebrows, eye instinct with thought. If it is particularly by the forehead a living blazon, that gentlemen of intelligence are to be known, the Chevalier de Chateaubriand has his nobility marked in splendid lines. Pale like Bonaparte, but with that paleness which has nothing to do with disease, there is beneath the profound accent of his features a cast of lofty melancholy that will never leave him. The mouth is small, with thin lips, which one finds as cherry of words, as the rest of his countenance seems to be rich in thoughts. In short, it is a head in a fine style, full of nobleness and observation. That lofty air of aristocracy which predominates cannot evidently belong to any other than a writer of the laced school of the Montesquieu's and the Buffons. He was then twenty years old. When he entered Paris, the famous eighteenth century, gorged with follies and with crimes, was about to yield up the little life it had left. Chateaubriand witnessed the last struggles of the monster on the golden sand of the court. The world plunged headlong into vice. Feeling that death was dragging them by the leg, the aristocracy made haste to quaff double draughts of pleasure and luxury. Each day produced some new extravagance. Grimaud de la Reniere gave his Homeric suppers in a room lined with black and furnished with hangings studded with silver tears. Count d'Artois tried on his celebrated inexpressibles, so tight that he was obliged to have the assistance of three men to lift him up into the air and shake him into them. The Marquis de Sade ran about the streets at night in quest of women to dissect alive. The last abbés were hooted at the theatre, and the last actresses at church. On their part, the Faroes and the Calogans, returning from playing at tennis, at the half-moon of the boulevard Saint-Antoine, defying the horse patrol, and began to break the lamps adorned with fleur-de-lis. Our young and haughty Breton dashed unmercifully through the cobwebs of the gallant spiders of the opera, without leaving either wings or legs behind and over the flowery hedges of Trianon he could observe, without danger to his heart, the nocturnal festivities of the Austrian queen. He was once invited to follow the chase, in one of his majesty's carriages. Perhaps that was the day on which he saw Louis the Sixteenth drop a paving-stone, laughing the while, upon the body of one of his guards, who had fallen asleep. All the society of that time, who had still a head upon their shoulders, passed before his eyes. Heroes, villains, lackeys, citizens, all the guillotined of later years. He dined with Mirabeau, he caroused with Mirabeau, and in return Mirabeau, looking him in the face, clapped his large hand upon the shoulder of the young lieutenant, which he well nigh dislocated. I fancied that I felt the claw of Satan, says he. Mirabeau, at table, boisterous, nervous, tearing his lace ruffles, was almost as fine as Mirabeau in the tribune. He drank like Basson Pierre, he laughed like Boreas. Chateaubriand never took his eyes off him, and he was no doubt already engraving on his memory those vigorous lines, in which he was afterwards to draw the portrait of that great man and that great rogue as m de conde called him mixed up by the irregularities and the accidents of his life in the greatest events and in the society of criminals ravishers adventurers mirabeau tribune of the aristocracy deputy of the democracy was a compound of gracchus and don juan of catiline and of guzman d'alparache of cardinal de richelieu and cardinal de retz of the roue of the regency and the savage of the revolution and added to this he had something of his own his ugliness, laid upon a ground of beauty peculiar to his race, produced a sort of mighty figure of Michelangelo's last judgment. The seams left by the smallpox on his face looked rather like scars caused by fire. Nature seemed to have moulded his head for empire and the gallows, chiselled his arms for coercing a nation or for carrying off a woman. When fixing his eyes upon the people, he shook his bushy hair, he stopped their movements. When he lifted his great hand and showed his nails, the rabble ran about furiously. During the tremendous uproar of a sitting, I have seen him in the tribune, gloomy, ugly, motionless, reminding you of Milton's chaos, shapeless and impassable amidst its confusion. But what he particularly desired to see were the circles where elegant language was spoken, the fashionable drawing-rooms, the academy and its auxiliaries. Had he not in one of the skirts of his uniform two or three thousand rhymes, chatty and brilliant birds, which long for nothing so much as the delight of being let fly, compactly ranged between the actors and the spectators, like the musicians in a theatre, the French literati continued to play Rinfort Sander, the overture of the French Revolution begun about fifty years before. The curtain rose, in place of the lead of the orchestra. There was Beaumarchais, the direct heir of Voltaire, who, for the society of that day, was as good as a pestilence, just as Chateaubriand, at a later period, was as good as an army for the restoration. 
Grouped around him, musicians of the devil, Ferron, Mercier, Rivarol, Laclos, Retief, and the rest, strove to decipher the sublime score, with eye fixed on the master, who was beating time. Chateaubriand perceived not, apparently, the grave side of all this. He was but a young man. At the moment when the age was cracking and tottering, like Soufflot's pantheon, he was gliding on tiptoe between two screens, in the company of some of the infinitely small fry of literature. They talked of me at Lebrun's, and at Flan des Oliviers. At length, however, he began to comprehend how puerile and miserable was this employment of all his time. He renounced it. Thus René says, I would fain have thrown myself into a world which told me nothing, and which did not understand me. It was neither lofty language nor deep sentiment that was expected from me, treated everywhere as a romantic spirit, ashamed of the part that I was playing, more and more disgusted with things and with men. I determined to retire to a faubourg, and there to live totally unknown. I found pleasure in this obscure and independent life. Unnoticed, I mingled with the crowd, vast desert of human beings. Meanwhile the revolution was approaching. It came direct towards him. He was frightened and drew back. His hour for action had not yet struck. With too much disdain, perhaps, he beheld the conquest of the Bastille floundering through the kennels of Paris, and turned away his head from the work of blood that was preparing. The whole of the nobility emigrated to Coblenz. Chateaubriand emigrated to the New World. Before he studied men, he resolved to study man. However, he did not set out without bidding good-bye. La Harpe, who was keeper of the literature of the eighteenth century, brought him the Mercure, to inscribe his name in, according to custom. Chateaubriand inserted in it I know not what verses on the love of a country life, a sort of idyll, in the face of which he could not help laughing subsequently, and in which occurs this couplet, Au séjour de grandeur, mon nom mourra sans gloire, mais il vivra longtemps sur les toits des roses. This is just the reverse of what he ought to have said. Monsieur de Chateaubriand was a better prophet towards the close of his life. 2. Here is the date palm. Beneath the date palm there is green sword. Under this green sword rests a woman. I who mourn beneath this date palm am called Saluta. I am the daughter of the woman who rests under this turf. She was my mother. My mother said to me when dying, Work. Be faithful to thy husband when thou hast found one. If he is prosperous, be humble and timid. Go not near him till he says to thee, Come, my lips want to speak to thine. If he is unfortunate, be lavish of thy caresses. Let thy soul cling around his that thy flesh be insensible to the winds and to pain. I, who am called Saluta, now weep beneath this date-palm. I am the daughter of the woman who rests under this green sword. Thus sang a young female, crowned with flowers of magnolia, clad in a white dress made of the bark of the mulberry-tree, seated amidst Indians on the grass, sprinkled with purple vervain and golden wells. René listened and eyed her with a look of emotion. There he is, far away from the country of the Bretons. That thirst of solitude which torments him, in common with all austere geniuses, he can now assuage. Between God and him, civilization no longer spreads its veil. His heart still suffers, but his mind expands and emancipates itself. Let him alone, by degrees the sun of the desert, will dispel from his brow the gloom of the woods of Combourg. It is probable that, but for his voyage to America, Chateaubriand would never have been more than a timid disciple of Larps and of the atrocious Gangrenes a drawing-room poet perpetually reined in by the artificial garlands of the academic coterie at the furthest he might have raised himself some day to the very innocent reputation of emenard or of the author of the printemps d'un prosqui on the contrary chateaubriand thrown bodily into the new world a white man among the red men eating limpets breathing the musky odour exhaled by the crocodiles of the swamps the young officer of the regiment of navarre hunting the beaver with the sachem of the onondagas after chasing the stag with louis sixteen lastly the rhymester of the Ammonite des muses among the iroquois must perforce be transformed and having departed with the idyll of the amour de la campagne return with the genie du christianisme the visit to america was an absolute revelation for him his classic recollections cut up by the root were effectually prevented from shooting up again and the corps de littérature began to vanish from his sight in the damp dust of the niagara only figure to yourself the astonishment of a literary man of the eighteenth century at sight of that strange gigantic nature full of life gracefully terrible and what a severe rebuke god gave before his face to the landscape gardener de notre dropped amidst blue herons rose-coloured flamingos red woodpeckers chateaubriand might well smile when he thought of that old french bird philomel on which we live exclusively ever since the mythologic era his memory is still full of the heroes of racine and voltaire having never seen savages but in the tragedy of alzire is it to be supposed that he did not start back at the sight of the first seminole that appeared before him with a pearl hanging from his nose his ears pinked and a stuffed owl upon his head it is perhaps to be regretted that he did not stay long enough to sweep his rhetoric away completely two years more chateaubriand would have totally drowned his old formal notions in the ohio 
his too rapid passage through the hot country has produced a mixed style in which the savage and the gentleman are at times equally apparent why did he leave it so suddenly what uneasiness caused him to renounce the splendours of the american nights we cannot tell and no doubt no more could he there was just then a whirlwind in the air which scattered to the four corners of the earth most of the men of that age the abbe maury de rome louis philippe to elsinore m de juy to the court of tipu saib and m de chateaubriand to every country perhaps like rene he heard a voice saying what dost thou here alone in the recesses of the forest wasting thy days neglecting all thy duties saints you will say have buried themselves in deserts yes they were there with their tears and employed in quenching their passions that time which thou art perhaps misspending in kindling thine whoever is endowed with strength ought to devote it to the service of his fellow-creature chateaubriand listened to this voice and recrossed the sea he has said since that his object was to join conde's army it is possible but scarcely was he in france at the time when the revolution made paris a vast focus of social decomposition when the clubs were discussing the people thundering mirabeau expiring while the monarchy was escaping by a secret door and the republic bringing it back by the ear while sanson was swaggering on his throne in the greve and going at night with washed hands to the theatre of the vaudeville at the hour in which all trembled all turned pale all was stiffened with terror chateaubriand went quietly in quest of a young lady whom he had previously seen twice or thrice he spoke to her she smiled upon him he offered to marry her and he did marry her no sooner was he married than he emigrated from this moment is to be dated his real misery and his novitiate of man till this moment he had been but a poetical elegant and melancholy dreamer now behold him leaping with pinioned legs in the beaten track of prosaic life famished suffering in body which had been thrown into a ditch like a dog who has not a sou who is thrust out of doors by the maids at an inn covered with sores plastered with mud with straw twisted round his legs like the most abject of beggars dying he crawled away on hands and knees he was placed in a baggage-wagon with half his body hanging out of it he was transferred to the hold of a vessel and again thrown on shore a man passing by accident a good samaritan of guernsey turned his face towards the sun placed him with his back against a wall and then left him but genius is tenacious of life some months afterwards m de chateaubriand was in london retiring to an old house in the outskirts at a crazy table he commenced the essay sur la revolution and translated from the english for a bookseller for eight years he fared very hardly his clothes were threadbare he never went out but in the evening in his melancholy rambles he was seen passing through the village of harrow at the time when the lively face and curly head of a boy lord byron's frequently appeared at the windows of the school i like this poverty of chateaubriand's and even his time-worn nocturnal dress which i should further have liked to see him keep for ever mr m said to him one day there is but one real misfortune the want of bread and the author of rene had frequent occasion to think himself really unfortunate he speaks in several places of the druggist and of the cutler who sold daggers that live close to his door but these are only passing griefs after which resigned and pensive we find him in the streets of london strolling at random his eyes among the stars or otherwise fully engaged before some palace devouring the riches displayed and watching duchesses going in and coming out as for high english society humble exile that i was i saw nothing but the outside of it when there were drawing-rooms at court or at the princess of wales's ladies passed seated sideways in sedan chairs their prodigious hoops protruding from the door these fair ladies were the daughters of those whose mothers the duc de guine and the duc de lausanne had adored in eighteen twenty two the mothers and grandmothers of the little girls who danced at my residence in short petticoats to the tune of collinet's galoubet the essay being finished he sold it to a worthy publisher in gerrard street it is a work without head or tail containing splendid pages and enormous absurdities a parallel between alexander and pichegru fragments of a sanskrit poem a denial of the authenticity of the new testament and a fable by mancini nivenois entitled le papillon et l'amour into the bargain all this was highly relished in england subsequently that is to say thirty years later chateaubriand himself pronounced judgment with unexampled harshness on this production the notes which he has added to it in the complete edition of his works concur to render this work one of the most singular monuments of literature i cannot suffer too much he says at the commencement for having written the essay tis a series of idiotisms and silly impieties ravings and impertinences or what did i mean to say in truth i know not no doubt i thought myself profound how i arranged the language what a barbarian sometimes there is an ironical approbation not so much amiss for a little philosopher in jacket and a thousand other graceful epithets which make us in spite of ourselves feel compassion for the author and be ready to beg pardon of m de chateaubriand for himself but with the lash in his hand the author of the essay turns round upon you 
and replies like a woman in Moliere, well, and if it is my own pleasure to be scourged. Chateaubriand lived upon the essay till the beginning of the nineteenth century, when he returned to France clandestinely and under a false name, as if striving to smuggle his genius into the country. 3. More romances in A. A deal of time I have forsooth to read all your trash. Such was the exclamation of the first consul one day, when his sister, Madame Bacciocchi, had called to see him with a small volume in her hand. That small volume was Chateaubriand's Atala. To describe the stunning clamour that was raised about this book would be difficult. Its author was enveloped in glory, and admitted into all the salons. He was translated in his turn. He who had translated so much. His work furnished subjects for pictures, parodies, caricatures, panegyrics, epigrams. All Europe was agitated by it. Travelling subsequently in Turkey, at the door of a mosque where he had declined giving his name, Chateaubriand saw a Mussulman running towards him, and was saluted by him with the exclamation, Ah, my dear René, and my dear Atala! It was not correct, but it was flattering. Atala has continued to dwell in the recesses of our youth like a fond recollection, blended with the most touching things of Catholicism and of love, like the distant sound of the organ. The present generation read it, just after its first communion, upon the corner of a pianoforte, at a time when all Paris was thronging, to admire Gerard's pictures, after a review held by General Molitor. Still to this day, in all times, under all points of view, Atala continues to be a delicious fantasy, full of extraordinary reflections, and which, for the local fidelity of the style, if not for the deep pathos of the subject, leaves Paul and Virginia behind. They are trapped as coloured and graceful as the plumage of the era. It is the first of novels in point of form, for Chateaubriand is the first that made a tool of his pen, and a solid substance of his language. After all, it was but a trivial prelude to the Genie du Christianisme, a short anthem before the Grand Mass. Divested of all his philosophical opinions, Chateaubriand aspired with all his energies to the initiative of a religious reaction. He could not have chosen a better moment. France, besotted with wine by the Directory, besotted with blood by the rule of terror, yesterday a fury, today a bacchanal, weary of the butcheries of the Place de la Révolution, was completely debasing herself in the orgies of the Palais Royal. After eating anchovy salad out of the sacred pyx, she went to Miot's to intoxicate herself with wine, a bottle of which he would not have given for all the assignats in the world. She then stopped to lounge with the befeathered nymphs of the perron. So Bonaparte had found her, so Chateaubriand had surprised her. One evening they two took her each by an arm and led her into a more decent track. Next day, on her waking, one of them made her sign the concordat, the other placed in her lap the génie du christianisme. Imagine a vase of myrrh overturned on the steps of a blood-stained altar, and you will have the impression produced by the appearance of that holy book. Tears of joy started into the eyes of every mother. People were almost ready to adorn the fronts of their houses, to strew the pavement of the streets with flowers, as for the entry into Jerusalem. Who is then this young man, said they to themselves, that piously brings back the God of his fathers in a fold of his cloak? France loves God. That love cannot be taken from her. Family and religion, ye are invincible for ye are the two sources of morality and love in you there is poetry lofty and lowly never shall ye be suppressed by maniacs vague dreams of youth mystic flames imperfectly extinguished deep and high affection of parents silent tears daily dropped upon tombs ye are stronger than all the philosophers i have just re-read the genie du christianisme it is still the book of our epoch the book for an eve of revolution it has balm for every wound comfort for all afflictions matchless book it proves and it moves, it reasons and it sings. It is the enthusiasm of the prophet in the logic of the historian. Nothing so beautiful has been seen since the imitation. In this Christian panorama, touching and grand scenes succeed each other in dazzling diversity. Fenelon wrote no otherwise. Bossier produced not more magnificent flashes. The phrase falls upon the idea in ample and rich folds, like a robe of purple on Olympian shoulders. You cannot but admire. It is well, too, that sometimes from amidst his majesty all at once proceeds a simple cry, which penetrates to the heart. It is a giant who, on the lofty rock where he is musing, has stooped to pick up an humble herb. Is it possible that Felicien David, when he composed his Dance of the Stars, could not have read the following passage, written by a formidable hand, which has no equivalent but in the productions, at once luminous and sombre, of Martin, the painter? Can one form a due conception of what a scene of that kind would be, were it left to the mere movement of matter? The clouds, obedient to the laws of gravity, would fall perpendicularly to the earth, or ascend in pyramids into the air. A moment afterwards the atmosphere would be too dense or too rarefied for the organs. The moon, too near or too distant from us, would by turns be invisible, by turns appear bloody, covered with enormous spots, or entirely filling the whole dome of heaven with its prodigious orb, as if seized with a strange vertigo, 
it would hurry from eclipse to eclipse or rolling from side to side at length expose that other face which the earth has never beheld the stars would seem to be struck with the same madness and exhibit only a series of frightful conjunctions yonder stars would pass with the rapidity of lightning here they would hang motionless sometimes crowding together in groups they would form a new milky way then disappearing altogether and rending the curtain of the universe according to the expression of tertullian they would lay open to view the abysses of eternity such are the pages profusely scattered that render the genie du christianisme an incontestable masterpiece of literature ever living and ever young nothing more was needed to place its author at the head of the intellectual movement and to found his reputation in a brilliant and solid manner he eclipsed at once all his contemporaries he had been the first he became the only one behold him once launched in the career of glory as in a chariot of fire he will proceed to the goal tiring admiration exhausting praise after wrestling with the bible in the genie du christianisme he wrestled with homer in the martyrs his poems counterpoised to battles they too will make the tour of the world and wherever canon have passed they too shall pass he will soon have but one rival in renown the emperor that is the name which causes chateaubriand to turn pale and muse chateaubriand that is the wall of brass which stops the emperor in amazement various have been the opinions expressed respecting the struggle between these two men in exchanging insults says one writer these two sublime workmen upon one work belied themselves that is true but when separated they nevertheless laboured both of them at the joint concern the military conqueror and the religious conqueror pursued a parallel course and the ideas met oftener than themselves face to face call it pride call it conviction still amidst this period of dismay before that emperor who made a pavement of bended heads it is fine to see one only face erect with upturned eye it is grand precisely because it is imprudent that pen as haughty as that sword that notable resignation which reaches that man the day before a murder that voice which pursues him under his new purple that gentleman who jeers that soldier one almost feels obliged to chateaubriand for his unbounded audacity and even those who followed most blindly the fortunes of the emperor sometimes forgot themselves so far as to admire that solitary courage ideologues ideologues that was the word which rage wrung from the emperor and he who never pardoned but who had a vague impression that the writer with all his weakness would some day counterbalance the might of the emperor strove to stifle his hatred and to extend unseen a furtive hand to the author of the genie du christianisme it was in vain take back your hand sire there is blood upon it from that moment all the advances of the corsican to the breton proved unavailing anger orders threats had no effect upon him on his return from his travels in greece chateaubriand gave napoleon a smart lash in the face with his pen he delineated him in the martyrs under the likeness of galerius he struck him under the shade of chenier the regicide he even threatened him as to the future then when the imperial colossus lay prostrate out he came with his famous pamphlet bonaparte et les bourbons and set his foot on the breast of him who would fain have had him murdered on the steps of his throne the pen never forgives a few months later chateaubriand followed louis the eighteenth in the second emigration rene was minister four minister that is now the dream of every one who carries a pen at his side the obligato epilogue of eminent personages it is the apotheosis and the martyrdom it is inconceivable what a number of strong heads france has ground in her political machine since the first revolution she renews the ancient fable of the minotaur men men she must have a man to devour every day chateaubriand has attained to the government by the mere force of his name of his works and of his character he has attained to it without shock quite naturally and because he was to attain to it he was born minister as he was born academician in politics m de lafayette begot chateaubriand and chateaubriand begot m de lamartine under the same azure oriflamme these three men take shelter but chateaubriand's task was not so hard as that of either of the others he had absolutely nothing else to do but to organize the repose which the world longed for from the height of the restoration we see him therefore shining at his ease but it is over a nation already blinded by the continual lightning and thunder of fifteen years his maxim in business was this do what is right happen what may his fall ensued as everybody knows i conceive that i discovered the salvation of the country in the union of ancient manners and the present political forms of the good sense of our forefathers and the intelligence of the age of the old glory of Gislin and the new glory of moreau in short in the alliance of religion and liberty if this be a chimera noble hearts will not reproach me for it assuredly not the good that he would have done but which he could not do he will never be charged with as a crime his apparent contradictions are effaced by the uprightness of his intentions the people do not read the laws said he one day they read men 
and it is from this living code that they derive information well in reading chateaubriand the people have read a good and a beautiful work only written too poetically for which reason they have not comprehended all its pages the misfortune is too that louis eighteenth did not keep him long enough though he might have assumed with him and through him airs of mitigated liberalism but he was jealous of m de chateaubriand that excellent monarch jealous of his talents jealous of his popularity so that he eagerly seized the first occasion that offered for getting rid of the minister who too much overshadowed the king having quitted the government poor and being obliged to sell his books he sought refuge beneath the tent of journalism and founded the conservateur in opposition to the minerve his fellow labourers were messrs de bonald laminet de corbiere et de castobajac they lived in the hatred of m de Caz, and all the acts of the ministry were then sifted through one of the finest sieves of the understanding from that period date the first teeth of the press muzzled by napoleon unmuzzled by chateaubriand he may be justly considered as a father of political journalism he became young again for this daily hand-to-hand -hand warfare young as he had never perhaps yet been on this burning ground his very style acquires new clearness it is not merely that sword of parade richly chased at the hilt it is a stout blade beautiful in its flaming nakedness tancred is here replaced by roland poetry is charming he says somewhere but we must beware of introducing it into matters of business in default of poetry m le vicomte pounces upon wit and indulges in it to his heart's content m de talleyrand must have envied him this sally it would be a useful thing to know how many silly ministers it would take to compose a ministry of talent we know precisely how many ministers of talent it requires to form a poor ministry all his political writings are in this taste they are fine specimens of raillery impetuosity temerity attempts were made in vain to smother him under two embassies under a shower of gold impossible he went on his way discussing men and things with that bold passion which is one of the distinctive signs of his political faces if he chanced to incline his ear and to listen to what was said of himself around him his answer was fraught with that high disdain which produces respect all within reach of his eye were silent we know it well the truths that we tell offend people are determined to sleep on the brink of an abyss after so many revolutions those are considered as enemies who warn against new dangers the voice that awakes us is annoying and it is agreed that none but passionate men or such as are disappointed in their ambition think that all is going on ill when it is evident that it is going on well one need not be astonished after this if it was found necessary to open to him soon the door of the hotellerie of the capuchins as he calls it and if he went a second time to eclipse louis eighteenth upon his throne chateaubriand the minister has his sympathetic points like chateaubriand the writer in politics as in literature you are sure to find him at the head of all the generous initiatives thus whether pamphleteer or holding the reins of government he never ceased to advocate the liberty of the press at his voice milton arose and said to kill a man is to kill a rational creature to kill a book is to kill immortality rather than life a lost truth is often not recovered in the revolutions of ages and for want of it whole nations suffer eternally at other times chateaubriand speaks in his name who suffers then by the liberty of the press mediocrity and some irascible self-loves but in the latter case when susceptibility finds itself united with talent it is fortunate for the state that this susceptibility put to the test should be inured to war by the combat then follows the lesson a grave severe lesson dropped from above the abyss calls the abyss the evil that we have done obliges us to commit a fresh evil we support from self-love the ignorances into which we have fallen for want of understanding and at last the decree the decree without appeal everything considered we perceive that only crime baseness and mediocrity need fear the liberty of the press crime repels it like a scaffold baseness like a brand mark mediocrity like a light all that are without talent seek the shelter of the censorship weak temperaments love the shade should one not say that these lines were written yesterday to-day this morning considered as a statesman chateaubriand withdraws himself from all judgment his politics are variable as life honesty is his principle he knows nothing but that ask him not then what he is whither he is going what are his intentions i do not believe that he well knows himself in his pamphlet on the bannissement de charles d et sa famille he says that he is a monarchist from conviction a bourbonist from honour and a republican by nature a private letter communicated to me by m augustin thierry likewise shows that sympathy for a possible republic a republic which he beheld approaching him with large strides a republic which alarmed and attracted him and which was destined to sound the hour for his death thus he wrote already at the time of the assassination of the duc de berry there is rising behind us a generation impatient of all yokes a foe to all kings it dreams of a republic it is advancing it presses upon us it pushes us 
it will soon take our place five years later his implacable finger penned the same warning the world totters it is led and is verging towards a republic we have said so and we repeat it this passage reminded me of the terror of horatio and hamlet when he exclaims in a subdued voice the ghost the ghost the downfall of the throne of the bourbons was to him the signal for retreat thenceforward secluded from political bustle he suffered nothing to escape his lips at distant intervals but sombre predictions which fell upon our epoch with the dull and continuous sound of a drop of water hollowing a stone we must not mistake these predictions have really a tinge of the marvellous that makes us muse it is a second sight but divested of the obscurity of language it seems as though god had designed to complete in him the politician by the prophet and showing his accuracy respecting the future to prove that he was right in regard to the past this phenomenon presented itself at several epochs of his existence and thus we see him at the distance of twenty-nine years predicting with fearful correctness the circumstances of eighteen forty eight we have no doubt that europe is threatened with a general revolution but the senseless men who are urging on this destruction flatter themselves perhaps in vain with the attainment of their republican chimeras the european nations like all corrupt nations will pass under the military yoke the sword will everywhere replace the legitimate sceptre this same idea recurs in his réponse aux journaux sur son refus de servir le nouveau gouvernement there cannot result says he from july days at a period more or less remote anything but permanent republics or transient military governments which would be succeeded by chaos strange warnings eloquent and sinister voice which has not been listened to with sufficient attention one hope however though a faint one is to be derived from these awful prophecies there will come a future a mighty future free in all the plenitude of evangelical equality but it is still far distant far beyond any visible horizon before arriving at that goal before attaining the unity of nations natural democracy the world must undergo social decomposition a time of anarchy of blood perhaps of infirmity certainly this decomposition has begun it is not yet ready to reproduce from its still unfermented germs the new world let us pause these fragments carry along with them too deep discouragement too painful depression the pen recoils at last from transcribing this perpetual inferno of the present age and rather than continue to follow him through his innumerable circles of suffering and terror we prefer turning to what he said in eighteen thirty let france be free glorious flourishing no matter through whom or how i shall bless heaven five on returning from his political campaign he confined himself wholly and solely to the publication of his complete works we shall not take up regularly each of his books to discuss its merits such a review would require too large a space in order to its sufficient development we shall endeavour merely to show the principal titles of chateaubriand to the notice of future readers the itinéraire de paris à jerusalem travels to jerusalem and the holy land is a good book which is suited to everybody because it is full of poetry and science and the reader learns a great quantity of interesting facts books of this kind which treat of everything and in which each finds something to please him ought not to be disdained though they are written without any sort of plan with reminiscences and perchance some compilation it seems to us that the itinéraire would be much better if too frequently and this is a serious reproach chateaubriand had not suffered his historical recollections to run away with him a landscape has no value in his estimation unless it has been celebrated in a poem and when he travels about in the world he does it too evidently as a gentleman guide-book xenophon or josephus in hand desiring the driver to waken him at the page turned down for a mark talk not to him about the alps they have nothing wonderful for him they are mountains that are not to be found either in the bible or in mythology they are fine only in themselves that is not enough for him pass unknown cottages twisted willows on the brink of nameless abysses streams which have never inspired a creature chateaubriand does not care to look at you this is wrong nature does not derive her beauty from man alone the author of rene ought to have recollected this in his journey to jerusalem chance played him some scurvy tricks which ought to have repressed his fondness for the pompous ordinary life never loses its rights and we sometimes see it burst forth in spite of himself when among the iroquois he had met with a scullion who was teaching those messieurs sauvages and those dames sauvages to dance a minuet in one of the cyclades at a village wedding at which he was present he heard the daughters of Monsieur pengali vice-consul at zea sing in greek the famous song ah vous dirigez maman shortly afterwards he fell at tunis during the carnival into a jovial party of officers who carried him off to a ball and forced him to put on a turkish dress chateaubriand in a turkish dress what must monsieur de fontaine have thought of it gracious heaven the natchez made a mistake in coming after the martyrs though composed long before the latter 
it completes with the voyage on emerique the series of the author's curious studies of the new world and contains descriptions unluckily mingled with speeches of satan and dissertations on taxes the savage is treated somewhat in the manner of st lambert in the tale of the des amis and of pani in his madagascar poems many a scene however such as the wild oat harvest and the death of rene reveal the brilliant touch of the master a little less hardness in the lines would perhaps have ensured lasting favour to the dernier des abonserages which sins precisely by faults unusual with the author that is to say by sobriety and absence of description from the pen of chateaubriand something better was expected than gonzales de cordoue and we must believe without doubt that it rained on the day that he passed through that city published at longer intervals the etude historique celebrated for their preface the essay sur la littérature anglaise and the history of ronce complete the considerable body of his works composed in the serene hours of advanced life his essay sur la littérature anglaise contains exquisite fragments and recurrences to the most delightful reverie it seems as though it were not the same man who is speaking the unknown sides of his talent are unveiled and giving himself up to the drift of his inspiration he relates the most familiar things of his head and heart with a moving smile we should be to blame not to quote this passage on the correspondence of love true touching taken from nature and which is as much out of his usual style as the martyrs for instance would have been out of the style of madame de sévigné at first the letters are long lively frequent the day is not sufficient for them the writer is at work at sunset a few lines are written by moonlight charging that chaste silent discreet light to cover with its modesty a thousand desires the part is separated at dawn at dawn the first gleam is watched for to write what is thought to have been forgotten in the hours of delight a thousand protestations cover the paper on which are reflected the first roses of aurora a thousand kisses are deposited on the burning words which seem to spring from the first glance of the sun not an idea an image a reverie an accident an uneasiness but has its letter some morning something or other steals almost insensibly over the beauty of this passion like the first wrinkle on the brow of an adored woman the breath and the perfume of love expire in these pages of youth as a breeze dies away at evening upon flowers one perceives it but will not confess it to oneself the letters become shorter diminish in number are filled with news descriptions extraneous matters some are delayed but one grows less impatient sure of loving and being loved one becomes reasonable ceases to scold submits to absence protestations still pursue their course they are still the same words but they are inanimate the soul is gone i love you is now no more than an habitual expression an obligatory form the i have the honour to be of a love-letter by degrees the language becomes colder the post day is no longer waited for with impatience it is dreaded writing becomes a fatigue one blushes in thought for the follies that one has committed to paper one would be glad to get back one's letters and to fling them into the fire what has happened is it a new attachment that is beginning or an old attachment that is ending no matter tis love that is dying before the beloved object six nothing equalled in calmness and beauty the poem of his last years an armchair at corinne's fireside the flowery solitude of his garden some journeys to holyrood in venice that is all and then too that other great journey into himself through his past life into his works that journey called the memoir d'outre-tombe it is to this last work the crown of his edifice that he has devoted the remainder of his days nothing could thenceforward induce him to return to public affairs neither the entreaties of friends nor that remonstrance of berangers which all france knows by heart no doubt he felt the approach of those stormy times through which we are passing and having no longer any hope but christ he despaired of all human powers and even of his own thus sometimes in his old age he was seized with singular complaints fits of literary gout as it were he groaned he grieved because democracy had at last found its way into literature as well as into the rest of society he for his part wanted no democracy he complained of the envy that attaches itself to great names of glories depreciated of reputations aspersed unjust on that point to a whole epoch which had paid him a respect truly unique he banters the school of eighteen thirty he satirizes perhaps too severely young men who get killed to attract the public attention but luckily these are only momentary shadows passing over his talents and his noble character age had no more effect upon his robust genius than upon his health he worked till his last day he dictated till his last hour in a preface he speaks of the obstinacy peculiar to his nature in my youth says he i have frequently written twelve or fifteen hours without leaving the table at which i was seated age has not robbed me of this perseverance in labour my diplomatic correspondence while minster is nearly all in my handwriting such too was the habit of voltaire 
active and indefatigable like chateaubriand till death came to surprise him in his athletic meagreness to any one who looks at him in front chateaubriand appears in the nineteenth century as the counterpoise of voltaire in the eighteenth the same universality in the subject the same courage in the conflict each of chateaubriand's works attacks grapples smites a corresponding work of voltaire's for fifty years past in fact there is not an inch of ground which the author of the genie du christianisme has not disputed with the author of the dictionnaire philosophique not a path in which he has not battled with him it is an incessant fight through history romance and philosophy he is one of the four great men who opened the modern epoch more complete and more enthusiastic than walter scott less exclusive than byron he is nearly of the height of the gigantic goethe the master of all he has raised imagery in literature anew to favour and from him date those artistical romances which strive to rival painting and sculpture nay even music curious productions signed balzac rubens gautier canova or liszt janin but our work would be incomplete if after detaching from a golden ground the pensive head of the veteran after having seated him on a cloud of incense having hailed him eternal and sublime we were not also to unveil his human side his errors and defects to be severe upon the perilous touch of the chisel given to the apollo of the vatican is after all but a mode of praising the unalterable harmony of the rest of the body every genius owes tithe to criticism however radiant be the one however modest the other and the illustrious shade which i evoke would himself be the first to spurn the praise that could only crawl upon its knees besides to him criticism will be nothing new he is one of those who have heard most pens grating around their renown his literary enemies form his escort and with that simple greatness which characterizes him he has himself granted them access in the edition of his complete works at their head first and foremost i distinguish the impetuous republican of the empire marie chenier verse or prose analysis or satire nothing came amiss to him to hurl at chateaubriand there is not a page in his works in which he does not deal him a malicious blow most frequently without reason as in his tableau de la littérature sometimes wittily as in the nouveau saint j'irai je reverrai tes paisibles rivages riant mescassebe permes des sauvages j'entendrai les sermons prolixement disserts du bon monsieur aubry massillon des déserts au sensible atala tous deux avec ivresse courant goûter encore les plaisirs de la messe it is well known that chateaubriand never forgave his sallies hence marie chenier is the only academician of these modern times to whom his successor has refused the alms of a regret perhaps this is carrying animosity rather too far there are hours in which political differences do not wholly excuse the forgetfulness of literary justice either from disdain or from some other sentiment byron never breathed a word concerning the author of rene on the part of the noble lord this is at least strange chateaubriand was not able completely to conceal his vexation can lord byron he says have known nothing whatever about me he who mentions almost all the french authors has he never heard talk of me paul louis courier was not more friendly towards him and gave him many a spiteful stab with a petty dagger wearing a pin's head he has called his romances a gallimaufry and ridiculed his administration from the author of the pamphlet des pamphlets to the author of the martyrs this may be easily conceived it is a war of the humming-bird with the lion but m gustave planche who has not quite the same excuses as courier has been still more brutal see how he speaks of chateaubriand in his book of portraits a second-rate critic in the genie du christianisme an inaccurate and wordy traveller in the itinerary a patient but useless imitator of virgil and homer in the martyrs and the natchez m planche approves of nothing but rene and the episode of veleda is not judging in this manner trying men by club law these are i believe the principal critics who have come forward to assail him in his glory if we now seek an answer to give them it is in chateaubriand that we shall find it and here it is men frequently deny the supreme masters they rebel against them they count their defects they accuse them of dullness prolixity eccentricity bad taste at the same time robbing them and dressing themselves up in their spoils but in vain do they struggle under their yoke everything is tinged with their colours everywhere do they leave behind their traces they invent words and names which help to swell the general vocabulary of nations their sayings and their expressions become proverbs their fictitious personages are transformed into real personages who have heirs and lineage they open horizons whence issue streams of light they sow ideas the germs of a thousand others they furnish all the arts with imagination subjects styles their works are inexhaustible minds or the very bowels of the human mind let us now be permitted to substitute our opinion to that of our predecessors according to us it is more especially as the figure that chateaubriand sheds lustre over his age the greatness of his life appears before that of his talent his name comes before his books he is himself a human epic he is visible from a great distance 
and respect reaches him before admiration hence for a long time to come perhaps he will still be monsieur de chateaubriand before he is plain chateaubriand for a long time to come perhaps majesty will reign before force majesty that is his great and superb crime epic and dramatic genius he wearies admiration he has innovated only by halves his literature is the literature of the eighteenth century a tempered among the savages the incas had previously opened the way and we recollect too well perhaps that chactas has been at versailles and seen racine's tragedies performed it is not with a little matter that chateaubriand composes his landscapes poussin has given him lessons he must have columns broken in half moonlight cinerary urns and over and above all this the genius of recollections seated pensive by his side this search after the grand leads him at times into excesses against which one cannot be too cautiously on one's guard i shall cite only as a single and signal example this sunset the luminary inflaming the vapours of the city seemed to oscillate slowly in a golden fluid like the pendulum of the clock of ages the extravagant poets of the sixteenth century could not have surpassed this the action he writes in the preface to the martyrs is of little consequence to me it is but a pretext for description why alas did heaven throw la up in his way as well as m de fontaine the french seminole he is not of the same opinion as voltaire who said that good works were those which make readers weep most genuine tears says chateaubriand are those that fine poetry causes to be shed there must be as much admiration as grief mingled with them this unfortunate system appears even in rene at the moment when the brother of amelie who is thunderstruck by the avowal of a criminal passion still finds presence of mind enough to round immediately the following period chaste bride of christ receive my last embraces through the chill of death and the depths of eternity which already separate thee from thy brother majesty chateaubriand sacrificed everything to it accordingly his genius special and constant in its pomp is not one of those that address themselves to all such as shakespeare for example the man of palaces and of taverns of kings and of drunkards great with the great familiar with the little forceful with each shakespeare a god speaking the language of men chateaubriand a man speaking the language of the gods chateaubriand called hamlet that tragedy of lunatics what would shakespeare have called moiser that tragedy of chateaubriand's as a poet it must be confessed chateaubriand is null or nearly so with the exception of some fifty verses i believe that he never made much account of his pindaric baggage how could it be otherwise when we find him supporting himself on a poetic system so false as that which he develops in the following lines poetry has its limits in the limits of the idiom in which it is written and sung one may make verses different from racine's never better in my opinion chateaubriand exists more particularly in his prefaces that is to say almost out of his books in his private letters and as we have already observed in his political style in short wherever he had not time to polish his phrases where he forgets aristotle where he writes off-hand or is himself in spite of himself for the time to come he will exist chiefly in his memoirs towards the close of life an important transformation took place in his talent i say important and curious it was at sixty that the season of his youth arrived on the brink of the grave this austere thinker who to a certainty has never smiled is suddenly seized with laughter the loud laughter of caillot montaigne lesage and sometimes also of voltaire his muse issuing from some unknown fountain of youth just now a goddess in purple robe reappears to us as a young damsel crowned with cornflowers she was juno she is now plain lydia or camilla or any other nymph that comes first the past work of chateaubriand a grand and harmonious whole appears to me like a marble palace in the midst of a forest all about it is enchantment and magnificence mysterious voices resound within intoxicating perfumes fill the air without every window opens upon a scene of rich foliage upon an extensive park adorned with statues upon a hill which bends beneath the vines tis a very beautiful palace only it is enclosed and imprisoned with iron railing sentinels defend the approach to it all round at the distance of above half a league and in order to get to it you must have at least seven or eight quarters of nobility the posthumous work of chateaubriand's that is to say his memoirs presents indeed if you must have it the aspect of a palace but not of marble it is of plain stone the cold splendour of grecian architecture has given place to the original expansion of the fantasies of gothic art a tract of the forest has been felled and on that side the eye penetrates into the swarming labyrinth of the streets of the city the rebellious gates stand open the guards have received different orders and citizens peasants populace women those who are gentlemen and those who are but men the man of science and the scholar everybody in short enter freely lazarus himself is seated on the uppermost step of the porch the martyrs may be compared to the gardens of the tuileries open to gentlemen of the bedchamber only the memoirs to the same garden open to all without distinction 
are the gardens of the Tuileries less beautiful since the wearers of blouses have been admitted into them end of introduction preliminary observations in the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred by francois rene de chateaubriand preliminary observations by the author paris april fourteenth eighteen forty six revised july twenty eighth eighteen forty six secret nubes quasi naves velut umbra job as it is impossible for me to foresee the moment of my death and as at my age the days accorded to man are but days of grace or rather days of suffering i wish to enter upon some explanations on the fourth of next september i shall have attained my seventy-eighth year it is full time that i should prepare to leave a world which is leaving me and from which i shall depart without regret the memoirs which this introduction will proceed are arranged in divisions corresponding with the natural divisions in the career of my life that sad necessity which has always pressed heavily upon me has forced me to sell my memoirs no one can form an idea of what i have suffered in being thus compelled as it were to mortgage my grave but this last sacrifice was demanded by promises i had made and it was due to the integrity of my character a feeling perhaps partaking of weakness caused me to regard these memoirs as confidants from which i was reluctant to part my intention was to have bequeathed them to madame de chateaubriand i wished it to be left to her choice either to publish or to suppress them their suppression would now be most in accordance with my own wishes deeply do i regret that before my departure from the world i have not been able to meet with some one sufficiently rich and trustworthy to purchase the shares of the society and not like that society compelled to submit the work to the press as soon as my death knell shall ring of the shareholders some are my personal friends others are kind individuals who have endeavoured to be serviceable to me the shares may possibly have been sold or they may have been transferred to third parties of whom i have no knowledge and with whom family interests must be paramount to every other consideration it follows therefore that my life in proportion as it may be prolonged must operate as a disappointment perhaps as an actual injury to those persons in short if these memoirs were now my own property i would either forbid their being printed or i would retard their publication for the space of fifty years these memoirs have been written at different dates and in different countries and i have consequently deemed it necessary to insert at certain points a few preliminary observations avant propos for the purpose of explaining the scenes by which i was surrounded and the feelings which occupied me at the moment when the thread of my narrative was resumed the varied circumstances of my life are as it were blended with each other in my moments of prosperity i have spoken of the days of my misery and in my days of tribulation i have retraced my intervals of happiness the scenes of my youth intermingling with those of my old age the gravity of my years of experience casting a shade over my years of liberty the rays of my sun from its dawning to its setting crossing each other and mingling together produce a sort of confusion or i may perhaps say a sort of undefinable unity my cradle partakes of my tomb and my tomb of my cradle my suffering becomes pleasure and my pleasure pain and after having read over my memoirs it appeared to me impossible to determine whether they were written in life's prime or in hoary age i know not whether this jumble the disorder of which i cannot now rectify will please or displease it is the result of the varying vicissitudes of my fate the tempest has sometimes left me with no other writing-table than the planks saved from my shipwreck i have been urged to publish some portions of these memoirs during my life i preferred speaking from the depth of the grave my narrative will then be told by a voice which ought to be somewhat sacred since it resounds from the sepulchre if in this world i have suffered enough to ensure hereafter my entrance among the shades of the blessed a ray from elysium will throw its protecting light over the pictures i have here sketched the world has used me roughly in life after death it may treat me more gently these memoirs have been the favourite object of my thoughts st bonaventure obtained from heaven permission to continue his after death i do not hope for such a boon yet i would fain revisit the world phantom-like and invisibly correct the proofs but it matters not for when my ears are closed by the hand of eternity i shall be deaf to all that may be said of me 
if one portion of my work has been more pleasing to me than another it is that which refers to my youth the most obscure corner of my life it was there my task to reveal a world known only to myself in wandering back to that bygone time and the society that has vanished with it i find only recollections and silence of the persons i then knew do any now survive on the twenty fifth of august eighteen twenty eight the inhabitants of st malo addressed me through the medium of their mayor on the subject of a floating basin for which a plan was then in contemplation in returning an answer to their application i proposed an exchange of kind offices i requested they would grant me a few feet of ground for my grave on the grand bay some obstacles originating with the corps of military engineers prevented immediate compliance with this request at length on the twenty seventh of october eighteen thirty one i received from the mayor m hovius a letter which contained the following the resting-place you wish for on the seashore within a few steps of the spot where you were born will be prepared by the piety of the inhabitants of st malo but a sad thought intrudes itself amidst the performance of this duty may the monument continue long unoccupied though honour and glory survive that which is transient on the earth with gratitude i quote these lines of m hovius in which there is but one word too much the word glory i shall therefore rest on the margin of the sea that sea which i so dearly love if i die out of france i desire that my remains may not be conveyed to my native country until the expiration of fifty years after their first interment that i may be spared a sacrilegious autopsy that my nerveless brain and throbless heart may not be examined to search the mystery of my being death does not reveal the secrets of life to me there is something revolting in the idea of a corpse on a journey blanched bones are light and easily carried they will be less weary on that last journey than when i have been dragging them hither and thither laden with the burden of my cares end of preliminary observations chapter one of memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter one secret nubes quasi naves velut umbra job vale ulu ne one october fourth eighteen eleven four years ago on my return from the holy land i purchased a little country house situated near the hamlet of onay in the vicinity of sceaux and chatenay the house is in a valley encircled by thickly wooded hills the ground attached to this habitation is a sort of wild orchard at the extremity of which there is a ravine bounded by a grove of chestnut trees these narrow confines seem to me to be the fitting boundaries of my long protracted hopes spatio brevi spem longam recesses the trees i have planted here are thriving but as yet so small that i overshadow them when i stand between them and the sun some day or other their spreading foliage will shade me and shelter my old age as i have sheltered their youth i have selected them as far as i was able from the various climes i have visited they remind me of my wanderings and serve to cherish other illusions in my heart should the bourbons ever reascend the throne of france i shall solicit as the sole reward of my fidelity to be made rich enough to add to my estate the border of woodland which encircles it i have grown ambitious and i wish to lengthen my walks by the extent of a few perches knight-errant as i am i have the sedentary taste of a monk since i have dwelt in this retreat i do not think i have three times overstepped the boundaries of my own enclosure my pines my firs and my larches promise to thrive but as those trees seldom keep their promises the valet au may perhaps by and by resemble a carthusian convent on the twentieth of february sixteen ninety seven when voltaire was born at chatenay i wonder what was the aspect of the spot destined in eighteen o seven to be the retreat of the author of the genie du christianisme it was here i wrote the martyrs the abonserage the itinéraire and moise to what shall i devote myself in the evenings of the present autumn this day the fourth of october being the anniversary of my entrance into jerusalem tempts me to commence the history of my life the man who has given the empire of the world to france only that he may trample on her that man whose genius i admire and whose despotism i abhor that man surrounds me with his tyranny and as it were shuts me out from the world but though he may crush the present the past defies him and i may range freely over all that has preceded his glory my sentiments have for the most part been concealed within my own heart 
or they have been manifested in my works only when applied to imaginary beings now while still loving my chimeras without pursuing them i wish to reascend the acclivity of my brighter years these memoirs will be a temple of death dedicated to my recollections the misfortunes which attended my father's childhood and the trials of his early life cast a gloom over his whole character and disposition this gloom had its influence on my mind it threw a shade over my youth and determined the course of my education i am of noble descent and i have profited by the accident of my birth inasmuch as i have retained that firm love of liberty which characterises an aristocracy whose last hour has sounded aristocracy has three successive ages the age of superiority the age of privilege and the age of vanity having emerged from the first age it degenerates in the second and perishes in the third those who are curious to know something of my ancestry may consult morary's dictionary the histories of brittany and of argentre by dom lubineau and dom maurice and the genealogical history of several illustrious houses of brittany by father dupaz information on the subject is also furnished by toussaint saint luc by le borgne and by father anselm in his histoire des grands officiers de la couronne the testimonials verifying my family descent were officially produced on the admission of my sister lucile as canoness to the chapter of argentière when she was to be removed to that of remiremont they were again produced for my presentation to louis sixteenth again on my affiliation to the order of malta and for the last time when my brother was presented to louis sixteenth my name was originally written Brion. subsequently through the changes in french orthography it was converted into Brion and beyond guillaume le breton writes it castrum briani there is scarcely a family name in france which does not present these mutations of spelling what is the orthography of du Gesclin? about the commencement of the eleventh century the briands gave their name to a castle of some importance in brittany which castle became the seat of the barony of chateaubriand the arms of the chateaubriands were originally pineapples with the device je sème l'eau geoffroy baron de chateaubriand accompanied st louis to the holy land where he was made prisoner at the battle of Masura. having recovered his liberty he came back to france and his wife sibyl died of joy and surprise at his unexpected return in recompense for the services of the baron st louis granted permission to him and his heirs to exchange for their old armorial bearings a shield of jewels scattered with fleur-de-lis of gold a cartulary in the priory of beret contains the following attestation qui et eus hereditibus sanctus ludovicus tum francorum rex propter eus probitatem in armis floris lili auri loco pomorum pini auri contulit the chateaubriand family at an early period diverged into three branches the first branch that of the barons of chateaubriand whence the two others sprang had its origin in the year one thousand in the person of Tienne, the son of Brion, and the grandson of Alain the third, Count or Lord of Brittany. The second branch was surnamed Seigneur des Roches Barito, or of the Lyon d'Angers, and the third branch appeared under the title of Sieur de Beaufort. The line of the Sieur de Beaufort, having become extinct in the person of the Lady of Rene, Christophe the second, a collateral branch of that line, became heir to the estate of Garonne in Morbihan at that time about the middle of the seventeenth century vast confusion prevailed in the order of nobility and many titles and names were usurped in consequence louis the fourteenth ordered an inquiry having for its object a just reinstatement of ranks christophe by reason of authentic attestations of his ancient descent retained his title and armorial bearings in conformity with the decree of the chamber established at rennes for the reconstruction of the nobility of brittany that decree which was issued on the sixteenth of september sixteen sixty nine was as follows decree of the chamber for the re-establishment of nobility in the province of brittany issued september sixteenth sixteen sixty nine the procureur general du roi declares m christophe de chateaubriand sieur de la garande to be the descendant of an ancient and noble family he is in consequence entitled to the rank of chevalier and to take for his armorial bearings jewels scattered with gold fleur without limited number and this after production of his authentic claims thereto etc etc the said decree being signed malesco this document shows that christophe de chateaubriand of la garonne was directly descended from the chateaubriand's sieur de beaufort historical documents distinctly connect the sieur de beaufort with the first baron de chateaubriand 
that the chateaubriands of villeneuve of plessis and of combourg were younger branches of the chateaubriands of la garande is proved by the lineage of amaury the brother of michel the said michel being the son of christophe of la garande whose extraction was confirmed by the decree above quoted after my presentation to louis the sixteenth my brother wished to augment my fortune by settling on me some of those benefices called benefices simples there was but one mode of effecting this object i being a layman and holding a military commission it was to obtain my admission into the order of malta my brother forwarded to malta my testimonials of nobility and shortly afterwards he presented a petition in my behalf to the chapter of the grand priory of aquitaine held at poitiers to the end that commissioners should be appointed to pronounce on my claim to admittance m pontois was at that time archivist vice-chancellor and genealogist of the order of malta at the priory the president of the chapter was louis joseph des escotes bailly and grand prior of aquitaine his coadjutors were the bailly of freslon the chevalier de la laurency the chevalier de murat the chevalier de longamet the chevalier de la bourdonnay montluc and the chevalier de boutier the petition was heard on the ninth tenth and eleventh of september seventeen eighty nine the memorial for granting my admission states that i deserved by more than one claim the favour i sought and that considerations of the greatest weight rendered me worthy of the satisfaction i solicited and all this took place after the taking of the bastille on the eve of the scenes of the sixth of october seventeen eighty nine and of the removal of the royal family from paris in its sitting of the seventh of august of that same year seventeen eighty nine the national assembly abolished titles of nobility how happened it that the knights and the examiners of my attestations found that i merited by more than one claim the favour i solicited etc i who was then only a sub-lieutenant of infantry unknown without influence without favour and without fortune my brother's eldest son i add this in eighteen thirty one to the original text written in eighteen eleven count louis de chateaubriand married mademoiselle d'orglande by whom he had five daughters and one son the latter named geoffroy christian the younger brother of louis the great-grandson and godson of monsieur malesherbes and bearing a striking resemblance to that celebrated man served honourably in spain as a captain in the dragoons of the guard in eighteen twenty three subsequently he became a jesuit at rome jesuits colleges are places of refuge to those who seek the solitude now gradually diminishing from the earth christian died recently at chieri near turin i who am old and infirm might well have expected to be called hence before him but his virtues had prepared him for heaven whilst i have yet many faults to repent of in the distribution of his family patrimony christian had the estate of malesherbes and the estate of combourg fell to the share of louis christian regarding the equal distribution as unlawful wished on his retirement from the world to resign the property which did not belong to him and to restore it to his elder brother my genealogical records would have warranted me had i inherited the ambition of my father and my brother in believing myself to be the descendant in the branche cadet of the dukes of brittany through our common descent from tienne the grandson of alain the third the blood of the chateaubriands has on two occasions been mingled with the blood of the sovereigns of england geoffroy the fourth de chateaubriand espoused for his second consort agnes de laval granddaughter of the count of anjou and of matilda daughter of henry i marguerite de lusignan widow of the king of england and granddaughter of louis le gros married geoffroy v twelfth baron de chateaubriand with the royal race of spain they were connected through briand younger brother of the ninth baron de chateaubriand who married jeanne the daughter of alfonso king of aragon among the noble families of france their alliances are numberless one croix married a charlotte de chateaubriand tantiniac the conqueror in the combat of the trente and the constable du Gesclin, contracted alliances with our family in all its three branches tiphaine du Gesclin, granddaughter of the celebrated constable bertrand resigned to briand de chateaubriand her cousin and heir the estate of plessis bertrand in treaties of peace chateaubriands were given by the kings of france as hostages or securities the dukes of brittany used to send to the chateaubriands copies of their laws and ordinances the chateaubriands became high officers of the crown and illustres in the court of nantes and they received commissions to guard the safety of their province against the english Brion the first was at the battle of hastings he was the son of eudon count of pontievre guy de chateaubriand was one of the nobles whom arthur of brittany 
selected to accompany his son when he went on an embassy to the pope in the year thirteen o nine i should never end were i to give in detail the family history which i have here briefly recapitulated the note which i have at length resolved to insert in consideration of my two nephews who are persons of more importance than myself in these old records will supply what i here omit in the text but in their depreciation of noble lineage people now go to an absurd extreme it has become the custom to boast of having sprung from the labouring class or of being the son of a man attached to the soil such declarations are not quite so noble-minded as they are philosophic are not they who make them taking part with the strongest the marquis counts and barons of the present day have neither privileges nor possessions three-fourths of them are starving and degrading themselves in each other by refusing to recognise the rank to which they severally belong can those nobles deprived of their own names or permitted to bear them only for the sake of convenience as things are named in an inventory can those nobles create any alarm i hope to be pardoned for having been obliged to enter into such puerile details of family genealogy but they were necessary for a due comprehension of my father's ruling passion which was the knot of the drama of my youth for my own part i am neither disposed to glorify the old state of society nor to complain of the new if in the former i was the chevalier or the vicomte de chateaubriand i am in the latter francois de chateaubriand i prefer my name to my title such was my father's reverence for titles that like a certain nobleman of the middle ages he would not have scrupled to have surnamed nicodemus un saint gentilhomme but leaving my father for the present i will now go back to christophe lord suzerain of la guerande and descendant in a direct line from the barons of chateaubriand from him i must conduct the reader to myself francois seigneur without either vassals or revenue of the vallee aux loups looking back to the genealogical tree of the chateaubriands we find it composed of three great branches the two first became extinct and the third that of the sire de beaufort prolonged through the chateaubriands of la guerande fell into poverty the inevitable effect of the law of the country by virtue of the common law of brittany the eldest brothers of noble families inherited two-thirds of the estates and the younger brothers shared among them the remaining third of the paternal property the scanty inheritance of these younger brothers diminished the more rapidly when they married and as the same distribution of the two-thirds and the one-third was observed among their children it naturally ensued that in course of time the younger brothers of younger brothers became sharers in a pigeon a rabbit a duck or a dog but still they were high chevaliers and precinct lords of a dovecote a rabbit warren or a duck pond we find in the old noble families a vast number of these younger sons whose lineage is traceable through two or three generations and afterwards disappears families having gradually redescended to the plough and become absorbed among the labouring classes whilst no record of their existence remains about the commencement of the eighteenth century the chief of my name and family was alexis de chateaubriand seigneur de la garande he was the son of michel who had a brother named amaury michel was the son of that christophe whose extraction from the sire de beaufort and the baron de chateaubriand was verified by the decree i have above quoted alexis de chateaubriand who became a widower was a man of most intemperate habits he passed his life in drinking and debauchery and would have made waste paper of his most brilliant family records contemporary with this chief of our name and arms lived his cousin francois the son of amaury who was the younger brother of michel francois who was born on the nineteenth of february sixteen eighty three was possessor of the little seigneuries of Touche and la villeneuve he married on the twenty seventh of august seventeen thirteen petronille claude lamour lady of langegu by whom he had four sons francois henri rene my father pierre seigneur plessy and joseph seigneur du parc my grandfather francois died on the twenty eighth of march seventeen twenty nine my grandmother whom i knew in my childhood was a beautiful woman the smile of whose sweet countenance brightened the shade of her old age she resided after the death of her husband on the manor of villeneuve in the vicinity of dinan the whole fortune of my grandmother did not exceed five thousand livres de rente of this her eldest son inherited two-thirds three thousand three hundred and thirty-three livres leaving one thousand six hundred and sixty-six livres de rente to be shared among the three younger sons and even of that sum the eldest drew a portion called the Preciput. unfortunately my grandmother was thwarted in carrying out her own designs by the waywardness of her children her eldest son francois henri on whom devolved the magnificent heritage of the seigneury of la villeneuve refused to marry and became a priest 
but instead of soliciting the benefices which his name would have warranted him to look for and with the emoluments of which he might have supported his younger brothers he was withheld either from pride or indifference from seeking any advancement he buried himself in the country and successively became rector of saint lanoc and of Merdrignac in the diocese of saint malo he had a strong passion for poetry and i have seen many of his compositions the lively and humorous disposition of this noble rabelais and the worship which this christian priest addressed to the muses in his humble presbyter excited no little curiosity he gave away all he possessed and died insolvent my fourth uncle joseph removed to paris where he shut himself up in a library his pittance of four hundred and sixteen livres being transmitted to him annually he spent his life amidst books and devoted himself to historical researches his sight was defective but as long as he was able to use his eyes he wrote a letter to his mother every new year's day this was the only sign of existence he ever manifested a singular accordance of taste has prevailed among some members of my family of two of my uncles one was a scholar and the other a poet my brother possessed a happy talent for inditing verses my sister madame de farcy was endowed with poetic genius of a very high order another of my sisters the countess lucile the canoness might have earned distinction by her writings and i have myself scribbled over a great deal of paper my brother perished on the scaffold the sorrowful lives of my two sisters were ended after a lingering imprisonment my two uncles did not leave enough behind them to pay for their coffins literature has been the source of my pleasures and pains and i do not despair under the favour of heaven to die in some public asylum my grandmother who had exhausted all her resources in endeavouring to make something of her eldest and her youngest sons was disabled from doing anything for the two others my father rene and my uncle pierre the family which had sown golden seed a semi law according to the device of its early ancestors now beheld no remains of its former greatness save the rich abbeys they had founded and in which their progenitors were entombed the chateaubriands had been presidents of the states of brittany by virtue of their possession of one of the nine baronies they had affixed their signatures to the treaties of sovereigns they had been securities for the maintenance of treaties and yet they had not sufficient influence to obtain a sub-lieutenancy for the heir of their name but the impoverished noblesse of brittany had still one resource the navy an endeavour was made to obtain a commission for my father but in the first place it was requisite he should proceed to brest be maintained there pay for masters purchase a uniform arms books mathematical instruments etc how were all these expenses to be defrayed the commission solicited from the minister of the marine was not obtained for want of some powerful influence to recommend it this disappointment threw the chatelain of villeneuve into a fit of illness my father now for the first time in his life gave proof of something like decision of character at that period he was about fifteen years of age on witnessing his mother's illness and anxiety he approached her bedside and said that he was resolved to be no longer a burden to her this story i have heard my father frequently relate rene said my grandmother with tears in her eyes what do you propose doing you can only till your ground but that will not provide us with the means of support he replied allow me to depart you have my permission go wheresoever god may guide you the weeping mother embraced her son and that same evening my father left the maternal home he proceeded to dinan where one of our relations furnished him with a letter to a resident of st malo the orphan adventurer embarked as a volunteer on board an armed schooner which set sail a few days after the little st maloan republic at that time nobly sustained the honour of the french flag on the sea the schooner joined the fleet sent by cardinal de fleury to the assistance of stanislas when the russians besieged danzig my father landed and was engaged in that memorable battle fought on the twenty ninth of may seventeen thirty four between fifteen hundred frenchmen commanded by the brave breton de Brion, count de plelo and forty thousand muscovites commanded by munich de Brion, the diplomatist warrior and poet was killed in this action and my father was wounded twice he returned to france and after a little time he again embarked on another expedition during which he was shipwrecked on the coast of spain where he was attacked and plundered by banditti having succeeded in obtaining a passage in a vessel proceeding to bayonne he at length found his way once more to his maternal home by this time his courage and good conduct had gained him friends through whose influence he obtained an opportunity of going to one of our colonies where he prospered and laid the foundation of the new fortune of his family my grandmother commended her son pierre to the care of her son rene pierre was monsieur de chateaubriand du plessis 
whose son Armand was shot by order of Bonaparte on Good Friday, 1810. He was one of the last of the French nobles who perished in the cause of the monarchy. My father took upon himself the charge of providing for his brother, though he had contracted, through his long-continued sufferings, an asperity of temper, which never forsook him. The non ignara mali is not always true. Misfortune may harden, as well as soften, the character. M. de Chateaubriand was tall and thin. His nose was aquiline, his lips compressed and colourless, and his small sunken eyes were of a bluish-grey colour. There was a peculiar expression in his eyes, which I never observed in any other individual. It was like that of the lion, and when he was roused by anger, the pupil of his eyes seemed, as it were, to start out like a ball. One passion was predominant in my father's mind. It was family pride. His natural melancholy increased with advancing age, and his habitual silence was broken only by bursts of passion. He was niggardly in the hope of restoring his family to its original affluence. He was haughty to the nobles of Brittany, harsh to his dependents at Combourg, taciturn, despotic, and dictatorial in his home, where he inspired no feeling but fear. Had he lived till the breaking out of the revolution, or had he been a younger man, he would have played an important part, or he would have allowed himself to be massacred in his chateau. His talent was certainly of a high order, and had he been a minister of state or a military commander, he would have been an extraordinary man. After his return from America, he began to entertain the design of marrying. He was born on the 23rd of September, 1718, and on the 3rd of July, 1753, being then in his 35th year, he married Apolline Jeanne Suzanne de Bede. This lady, who was born on the 7th of April, 1726, was the daughter of Messire Ange Annibal, Count de Bede, seigneur of La Boetade. The newly married pair settled at St. Malo within seven or eight leagues of the spot where both were born, and they could discern from their residence the horizon beneath which they had each first seen the light. My maternal grandmother, Marie-Anne de Ravenel de Boiteille, Lady of Bede, born at Rennes on the 16th of October, 1698, was educated at Saint-Cyr during the latter years of Madame de Maintenon. Her education extended its influence over that of her daughters. My mother was gifted with much intelligence, and she possessed an extraordinary share of imaginative talent. Her mind had been formed by reading Fenelon, Racine, and Madame de Sévigné, and her memory was stored with anecdotes of the court of Louis the Fourteenth. She knew all Cyrus by heart. Apolline de Bédé had large features and was of a dark complexion. She was small in figure and by no means handsome. Nevertheless, the elegance of her manners and the amiability of her disposition formed a pleasing contrast to the sternness and gloom of my father's character. She loved society as much as he loved solitude. She was as susceptible and animated as he was cold and imperturbable. All her tastes were at variance with those of her husband. The opposition she experienced wrought a change in her disposition, and from being lively and gay she became serious and melancholy. Obliged to hold her tongue when she wished to speak, she recompensed herself for the privation by manifesting a sort of parade of grief broken by sighs, which alone interrupted the mute melancholy of my father. In piety, my mother was an angel. End of chapter 1chapter two of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter two valet au loup december thirty first eighteen eleven birth of my brothers and sisters my entrance into the world at St. Malo, my mother gave birth to her first son, who died in infancy. He was named Geoffroy, which has been the name of almost all the heirs of our family. This son was followed by another, and by two daughters, who lived only a few months. All these four children died of effusion of blood on the brain. At length my mother gave birth to a third son, named Jean-Baptiste, who became the grandson-in-law of Monsieur de Marzerbe. After Jean-Baptiste, four daughters were born. They were named Marie-Anne, Benigue, julie and lucile and all were endowed with rare beauty the two eldest alone survived the storms of the revolution i was the youngest of these ten children it is probable that my fourth sisters owed their existence to my father's desire to ensure the transmission of his name by the advent of a second son 
I retarded the fulfilment of his wishes. I must have had an aversion to life. The subjoined is an extract from the register of my baptism. Copied from the civil register of the commune of Saint-Malo for the year 1768. François René de Chateaubriand, son of René de Chateaubriand, and of Pauline Jeanne Suzanne de Bédé, his wife. Born the 4th of September, 1768, and baptized the day following by us, Pierre-Henri Noailles, Grand Vicar of the Bishop of Saint-Malo. His godfather was Jean-Baptiste de Chateaubriand, his brother, and his godmother was Françoise Gertrude de Contard, both of whom, as well as his own father, signed the register. The signatures are Contard de Plouet, Jean-Baptiste de Chateaubriand, Brignon de Chateaubriand, de Chateaubriand et Noailles, Vicar General. It will be seen that I fell into an error when in several of my works I stated that I was born on the 14th of October, instead of the 4th of September. I have also made a mistake in my Christian names, which are François René, not François Auguste. The house in which my parents then resided was situated in a narrow and gloomy street of Saint-Malo called the Jew Street. It is now turned into an inn. The room in which my mother was confined overlooked a solitary part of the town wall, and from the windows the sea was seen stretching as far as the eye could reach, with the waves breaking on rocks. My godfather, as my baptismal register shows, was my brother, and my godmother was the Countess de Plouet, daughter of Marshal de Contard. On first entering the world I showed but little signs of life, and the vague howlings of a tempest announcing the autumnal equinox prevented my cries being heard. The details of my birth were often related to me, and their impression has never been effaced from my memory. A day seldom elapses on which, looking back to the past, I do not see in imagination the rock on which I was born, and the chamber wherein my mother inflicted life upon me. The storm which rocked my first slumber again resounds in my ears, and I behold once more the ill-fated brother who gave me a name which I have incessantly drawn into misfortune. It seemed as though heaven had combined together these different circumstances in order to make my cradle the image of my destiny. End of chapter 2「Villeneuve, Lucille, the Mademoiselle Coupard, schoolboy days. My separation from my mother was my first exile. I was sent to Plancoué, a pretty village situated between Dinan, Saint-Malo, and Lombard. My mother's only brother, Count de Bédé, had built near this village the Château de Montchois. The possessions of my maternal grandmother extended as far as the environs of the town of Courcel, the Curiosolites of Caesar's commentaries. My grandmother, who had long been a widow, resided with her sister, Mademoiselle de Boiteilleul, in a village separated from Plancoué by a bridge, and called La Baie, because it contained a Benedictine abbey consecrated to Our Lady of Nazareth. The woman to whose care I was consigned was unable to perform the duties of nurse, and another good Christian was selected to take charge of me. This new nurse placed me under the guardianship of the sacred patroness of the village, Our Lady of Nazareth, in whose honour she vowed I should be clothed in blue and white, until I was seven years of age. Even in my tenderest infancy the hand of time had already laid its impress on my brow. Why was I not allowed to die? It pleased God to concede to the prayers of a poor and simple peasant woman the preservation of a life doomed to vain renown. This vow of the Brittany peasant woman is not a thing of the present age, but there is something touching in the idea of a divine mother mediating between the infant and heaven, and sharing the solicitude of an earthly mother. At the expiration of three years, I was taken back to Saint-Malo. Seven years previously, my father had recovered possession of the estate of Combourg. He wished to have regained other possessions which his ancestors had parted with. He was, however, unable to bargain for the seigneury of Beaufort, which had passed into the possession of the Goyon family, or for the barony of Chateaubriand, which had fallen to the house of Condé. He therefore turned his attention to Combourg, written Combourg by Froissart, which several branches of our family had possessed through intermarriages with the Coetcon. Combourg defended Brittany against the Normans and the English. 
which was built by Junken, Bishop of Dol, in 1016. The great tower is of the date of 1100. Marshal de Durin, who held Combourg by right of his wife, Maclovie de Coetcan, the daughter of Chateaubriand, arranged the transfer with my father. The Marquis du Allais, an officer in the horse grenadiers of the Royal Guard, is one of the last scions of the Coetcan Chateaubriand. At a subsequent period, the Marquis de Durin, in quality of our kinsman, presented my brother and myself to Louis XVI. My professional destination was the navy. To stand aloof from the court was natural to every Breton, and particularly to my father. The aristocratic character of the states of Brittany fortified him in this sentiment. When I was brought back to Saint-Malo, my father was at Combourg, my brother at the College of saint brieuc and my sisters were living with my mother. All my mother's affections were concentrated in her eldest son. Not that she was wanting in love for her other children, but she manifested a blind preference for the young Count de Combourg. As the last comer, and as the chevalier, for I was called by that title, I at first enjoyed some privileges over my sisters, but after a time I was consigned to the control of the servants. My mother's leisure and thoughts were wholly divided between her love of society and her attention to the duties of religion. The Countess de Plouet, my godmother, was her intimate friend, and she numbered in the circle of her acquaintance the relations of Maupertuis and of the Abbe Troublet. My mother was a politician, for the inhabitants of Saint-Malo discussed politics like the monks of Saba in the ravine of Cedron. She was much interested in the affair of La Charlotte. The warmth of her political feeling and the discussions into which it led her probably had the effect of irritating her temper. At home she was cross and excitable, qualities which, joined to habits of parsimony, blinded us for a time to her many admirable qualities. Though herself not deficient in the spirit of order, yet her children were brought up in disorder. Although in reality generous, she appeared avaricious, and with an amiable disposition she was continually peevish. My father was the terror of the domestics, my mother their scourge. The temper of my parents gave birth to the first sentiments of my childhood. I attached myself to the female who took care of me, an excellent woman named Villeneuve. I now write her name with an emotion of gratitude, and with tears in my eyes. Villeneuve, who was a sort of superintendent of the household, used to carry me about in her arms, and give me by stealth all the nice things she could lay her hands on. If I wept, she would dry my tears, and embrace me fondly, muttering, He will not be proud, I know. He has a kind heart, and will be good to the poor. Here, my little man. With these words she would slip some pieces of sugar into my hands. But my childish affection for Villeneuve soon yielded to a more elevated friendship. Lucille, my fourth sister, was two years older than myself. Like a neglected younger daughter, her dress consisted of the left-off clothes of her elder sisters. I leave the reader to imagine a very thin little girl, too tall for her age, her arms swinging awkwardly at her sides, oppressed by timidity, as if afraid to speak and unable to learn anything. Picture her dressed in a frock not made to fit her, her waist compressed by corsets, with whalebones running into her sides, forced to hold her head erect by an iron collar covered with brown velvet, her hair turned up and confined beneath a black toque, if the reader can imagine all this, he may be able to form some idea of the miserable little creature whom I beheld on my return to the paternal roof. Could I ever have conceived that she would one day be adorned with the talent and beauty which distinguished Lucille? She was my playmate, or rather, I was allowed to make her my plaything. I did not abuse my power. Instead of being her tyrant, I became her defender. Every morning Lucille and I were taken to the sisters Coupard, two old hunchbacked women dressed in black who taught children to read. Lucille was a bad scholar, and I a worse one. The governesses scolded Lucille, I attacked the governesses. Serious complaints were, in consequence, carried to my mother. I began to be looked upon as a rebel, an idler, and a dunce. This ill opinion of me took a firm hold of the minds of my parents. My father used to say that not one of the Chevalier de Chateaubriand had ever been remarkable for anything but sporting, drinking, and brawling. My mother sighed and groaned when she happened to see my coat torn. My father's ill temper disgusted me, and when my mother summed up her remonstrances with the eulogy of my brother, calling him a Cato and a hero, I felt inclined to make myself as bad as it seemed I was expected to be. My writing master, M. Dupre, who wore a sailor's wig, was not better satisfied with me than my parents. He made me eternally transcribe from a copy of his setting the two following lines which I heartily detest, though not simply for their own demerits. C'est à vous, mon esprit, à qui je veux parler, vous avez des défauts que je ne puis sceller. Saint-Malo is merely a rock. It formerly rose in the midst of a marsh, 
and became an island by the eruption of the sea which in seven hundred and nine worked out the gulf and placed mount st michel in the midst of waves at present the rock of st malo is connected with the mainland only by an embankment poetically called the sillon this sillon is exposed on one side to the open sea and on the other is washed by the flood tide when it enters the harbour it was almost entirely destroyed during a hurricane in seventeen thirty at ebb tide the harbour is dry and on the margin of the sea east and north is a beach of the finest sand at that time it was possible to make the circuit of my paternal home in the course of a walk far and near the eye ranges over rocks forts and inhabited islets fort royal la conche ses ombres and the grand bay which is to be my last resting-place i chose an appropriate spot without being aware of it for bay in the breton language signifies tomb at the extremity of the sillon where a calvary is erected there is a sand-bank on the very margin of the sea this bank is called the auguette and on it are the remains of an old gibbet round the posts of which we children used to play at quatre coin disputing our places with the sea-birds but it was not without a certain feeling of terror that we loitered on this dismal spot here too are the meal or downs affording good pasturage for sheep on the right are meadows stretching along the foot of the parame the post road to saint servin the new cemetery another calvary and some windmills on little hillocks like those which rise above the tomb of achilles at the entrance to the hellespont End of chapter three